You cannot operate by faith in a shortcut move. You can't do that. You cannot operate by faith because it's the easier way and it's a shortcut. You cannot do that. Faith is when you obey the Lord, number one. You can't exercise faith without obedience. It's impossible. You have to obey the Lord first. And he made you and he equipped you. He qualified you for certain things. So you have to exhaust what you know how to do. You have to exhaust what you have an ability to do. And every ability he bestowed in you is going to be required of you. That's why we should never be lazy. But to exhaust everything we know how to do, if you're obedient, that's the first thing you're going to do. You're going to exhaust everything the Lord put in you to do. And when you do that, if you ever reach one of those moments where something is so far outside of the range of your skill set or something like that, the Lord will never fail to pick it up and complete it. He'll never fail to do that. He even answered the question when he was talking about prayer. And the reason why some people do not get their prayers answered is due to their motive of the prayer and what they'll actually do with whatever they pray for. The Lord knows I have knowledge knots. Do you guys know what those are? It's cartoon knots. Somebody bangs you over the head and a big knot swells up. Looks like mountains on your head. Why do you think I'm so, so strong in my faith behind Scripture? Because I have a lot of experience with not doing anything that lines up with Scripture. And I knew to do it. And every time I would see the Scriptures come to pass, I'd be like, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. But the Scripture will come to pass in your life every day in this way. You can either obey and get the part you really want, or you can disobey and get the part that God often talked against. But it's going to come true with everything you do. There is no neutral area. You get the punishment or the consequence, or you get the blessing. You're going to make the choice. Because if you know and you walk and go do something else, I don't feel sorry for you. What I do feel is that you should really stop that. You're going to have a heavenly concussion here shortly, and that those are bad. The Lord is good in His Word, though. He's always operating in His Word. He's never absent. He is always present. And His principles, they're in us. When we disobey, we know when we're disobeying. We can play we're cuckoo all day like we really did not know. But there's even a principle behind that. The Lord already has given us scripture behind that. Let's put it this way. There's no way you do not know right from wrong. We fool ourselves and other people when we say, well, I didn't know that that was wrong to do we're lying because the lord said the opposite everybody's built in with knowing right from wrong or else the father could never judge he will never judge a person who truly does not know he already said that he will judge a person according to what they obeyed that's what he's going to do and what they disobeyed that means whatever you know you're going to be accountable for what you don't know is not going to hurt you in this case as far as judgment because we don't have a father who's a a lawyer with technicalities he's not some crooked court right that's not what he is not a crooked judge he didn't run a cricket court and jesus is not some attorney with tricks up a sleeve to get you off the hook of this that, and the other no everything is straightforward the process is clear we often deceive ourselves by you know rehearsing a lie within our minds and then saying well the lord's gonna forgive me anyway let me go ahead and do it don't don't do that either we know we just know and we don't do much like israel did even the lord said the heathen through his uh transition would go through a process much like his own people how they were stiff-necked and did not obey, that most people go through that same transition. And now it's on many different levels. So you can't really evaluate somebody else's life. Just like me, I'm not here to evaluate your life. No, I'm here to encourage you in following his truth, not my truth, his truth. The days are coming, folks. The days of heat, the days of calamity in this area, the days of joy, the days of revival, the days of an extended knowledge base. All of you are about to be upgraded, so to speak. What do I mean? by that the lord made a promise and it's for a specific time those who have even more is going to be given to them but those who only have a little that little bit is going to be taken away so those who have a little bit of knowledge but could have operated by a wealth of knowledge because they had no interest that little bit of understanding that they have is going to be wiped away the lord only does that when he totally condemns a person why will the lord totally condemn a person when they reject his son big time not just some slip of the tongue either remember in revelation they hated god 
which means they knew him. They're not like the people that were the, the atheists of the last few years. No, these people knew God. So how do they know him? Because they were among you. There is an exodus that will take place. And those people, God will send them a strong delusion. He's going to send them something they can believe in. Those are the ones who do not love God. Now that is going to be a topic of topics. The Lord's going to send people exactly what they want to believe in, but it will not be Jesus Christ. You know how people like these alternative things? They love these alternative things. And we're talking about Christians, we're not talking about the unbelievers, but there are a lot of Christians who would like Jesus to be, well, but just more simplistic in his speech. They'd like Jesus not to speak in parables. They'd like Jesus to just go ahead and let them do this or let them do that. They're going to get it, but it will not be the Messiah. God's going to send them a strong delusion. The very thing that they can believe in is going to be sent and that's what they will believe in, that they all might be damned, who did not love the truth, but indeed had pleasure in unrighteousness. They loved those things of the world more than those things of the Father. And God will give them over to that delusion and a reprobate mind and everything else, and they will be damned. They will not be among you anymore. Because I'll tell you right now, those are the ones that do a lot of damage inside the church. Now, we can withstand that. There's coming a breakaway moment. And I'm telling you right now, they're going to choose a different type of salvation. Think about this within yourselves and do a self-evaluation. How many times did you get bored with the New Testament to the point where you did not open the New Testament for some months? You don't have to answer that because most people go through this process. But I want you to get your mind back in that hour, that time. When the world was much more interesting than anything in the gospel was. Just think of it. I know this sounds like, you know, why is he speaking this? This is a deep, deep secret. None of us would ever do that. Oh, sure we would. But just think back to that time. And then when you went back to the word, how ashamed were you that you walked away in the first place? And just what would happen if the Lord left you out there? Because indeed, wasn't it him that called you back to his word? Because the further you step away from the word, the less your appetite is from feeding on on spiritual food. Somebody out there knows I'm telling the truth. Many of you have been through this. The Lord will send them a strong delusion so that this time when they step away, they're going to step in to a euphoric type of belief, something that fulfills their flesh exactly what they're looking for. He will send them their own imaginations. They're going to believe in it. They're going to be stuck. They will never return. that will be the end of that. The Lord's not playing here. He will discover the authenticity of all of us on an individual basis. Qualify yourself. Make sure that your salvation is highly secure. Check all areas of your own life so that you can stand up and get to work. There are people out there that still need you. And Satan is trying to trick the greater half of you to stay stagnant, wrapped up in your own problems. You haven't realized yet there's always going to be something you face in your lifetime. Once you understand that, you'll no longer pause because you have a problem. But you'll keep going in your servitude of your fellow man. When that happens, you're going to see the restraining gates that Satan propped up get bulldozed over by your will to do the Father's will. In my encounters with people, the only time I've ever desired to interject anything in their life is if they were about to go headlong into a ditch for real. A ditch that I am well accustomed to. Otherwise, I don't interject my own opinion into their lives, nor do I try to correct them with everything they do. First, I realize the process of growth, and I agree with the Lord in his process of growing us, which means everyone must learn how to fall. To learn to fall is to gain wisdom because the Lord cushions that fall, but it gives us experience and it gives us that tangible knowledge and knowing that, hey, if you do these things this way, that will lead to death. And normally when we fall, he's gently showing us what could kill us. Now I'm talking about make you perish, make you to be nothing to separate you from the Father. So plenty of us have fallen. But when it comes to another individual, I have no desire to have dominion over somebody else's life. And because I have no desire to be in charge of anybody else, because I don't have that desire, I don't have an opinion for everything somebody else is doing. I'm not one of those who's going to jump into a conversation and say, well, you know, I don't agree with that, don't because nobody cares. I know that the Lord is ultimately handling 
the growing of us. It's in his hands. He will present to himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. I also know that when the Lord gives you an unction to correct somebody, he has already prepared that person to receive from you. But if we jump in under our own steam, in our own time, we do nothing more than create arguments. And I don't do arguments. Arguments are foolish and useless. So when it comes to seeing the fault of somebody else, realizing that all of us begin with faults and all of us have to grow. What it does is when you understand this, your compassion for a person will grow and you tend to watch them like a bigger brother or a sister would, somebody who's just learning to walk. You stand ready to really try and cushion them if they fall flat on their face because what they're doing is, is just totally messed up. But you don't jump in there every single time because you understand they have to fall or they will not grow. Now again, if the Lord gives me an unction, normally it's when a person is going headlong into the gates of hell itself. In that case, if he gives me an unction, I'm going to go. And in every single case when this has happened, I've faced no rejection in every single case. But when I go on my own because of what I see and evaluate, there's always rejection. There's always rebuttal. He sends you these unctions, right? At first, they begin slight. But if you pay attention to those unctions and the real compassionate feelings you get inside, your feelings are involved too because something of the Spirit takes over everything. And you know that you know that you know that this that you've got to go do this with this person. And when you do this, and it is spiritually confirmed internally, and you do it, it's not rejected, and everything works out, and you're just astounded by what the outcome is. That's the Lord guaranteeing. Now, if you see something and you're emotionally touched and because you've been there before, that doesn't mean the Lord sent you. That's not what that means. That means you are emotionally touched by what you're seeing. And I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the Lord giving you an unction because when he gives you an unction, he normally does not send you into familiar territory. He will send you in the place you would never go. That's what normally happens. We go to places that we're comfortable with, thinking, I can handle this, I can handle it. I know that person, I know this person. We're the ones that start the storms. But if I don't wish to exercise any authority nor have dominion over anybody else, so because that is not in my heart, I do not interject my opinion because I realize something else. Listen to me carefully. I want you to think of a person who has gotten struck by a car. They're in serious condition. First of all, if I walk up to an individual like that, I want to be a little reluctant to even touch them, knowing that if they move the wrong way, it could sever arteries, it could cause massive bleeding, it could make the problem worse, so I'm not going to touch them. Now, that means a person is hurt on the road. I'm not going to touch that person. I will do what's necessary to get that person help, do you understand? But I myself am not going in there like I'm some surgeon to do anything. I'm not going to do it because that situation has to be assessed and who Whoever touches that person is going to be fully liable for what happens to that person. This happens all too often. You get these people that run over there. Oh, let me drag you out. And they do that. And the person dies. Why? Because they moved them. Because they had a, a, a traumatic injury in the neck of the spine and they die. So I'm not going to do that. I want the person to get real help, not my help. And so what I'm going to do is totally rely upon the Lord in that case, in every single case. So in a car accident, you just don't run up on a person. You don't know anything about surgery, the internal workings of the body, what's severed, what's not because you cannot see and start jolting the person around taking command of the situation without experience in that you can't do that because you may hurt that person the same way me running up on an accident and then trying to help somebody without knowing what's going on on the inside of that person is the same thing we do with each other we do not know what's going on inside the other person if the lord does we don't you don't know what they're thinking of what's hurt them in the past you don't know what the case is and all too often we run up trying to be the solution for somebody else life in view of other people or trying to, to, to exercise some type of dominion over the person or trying to express to the person, hey, I know what I'm talking about, so listen to me. And then we make matters worse in their lives. This is why you have people walking around right now and they say, well, you know, I've been hurt by churches. Well, what do you mean you've been hurt? Well, the people in the church, I've been hurt by them. And so I stay away. I meet people like that every month. They've been hurt by a church. I meet people like that every single month. It's not good. And normally it's because 
talking to these people, you realize that people have come in and tried to run their lives, instantly telling them what they have to do and what they have to change in this and not allowing a person to grow by God's standards. God the Father is the one that will allow us to have another day or not. So he knows exactly how long we're going to live. He knows exactly what he's doing in our lives. But to examine the faults of another is to see the splinter in somebody else's eye, knowing that we too are in a process, that we too do not know everything, that we are, we too are often proven wrong. So because I know these things, I'm totally reliant upon the Lord before I interject in anybody's life. I do not want to further the injury, make the injury worse is what that means. I don't want to do that. I don't want to, you know, happen to talk to somebody or, you know, get somebody happy in the wrong thing that's not going to happen for them because God has not given me vision of the inside of that person. You have to see a complete person, not just the outside. Now, pride is in your life. You're going to assume that you know what that person is going through, and that's a big mistake. This is how Satan works division among us through our pride, through our own shortcomings. He will work through those areas of your life that you have not given to the Father, and he's going to work through those areas of your life. Those times you've been hurt in life, you didn't hand all of that over to the Father. And so if you still have very tender areas in your life, he's going to wait until you're in proximity with somebody else and touch one of those tender spots you're going to end up doing something you shouldn't do you'll be used as an instrument to hurt somebody else it's just like parents parents in a house should never argue or have deep conversations around a child not ever the child is a child the child will have enough drama soon enough when parents can't agree on something they should be responsible enough to go out of sight and out of the, that little area of hearing of the children and solve the problem quickly to get back to the children. Because Satan is only going to nurture an argument if he's trying to get to the children. And do you know parents can't even see that these days? I hope you know that. They cannot see it. Their true target in a household is not really the man or the woman. It's the child. They're the ones that can be molded. Do you guys understand? If you're a parent of a child, God's entrusting you with another soul. Realize that. So they're the whole object of your house. They're the objective of your house. Those little souls. Just today, uh, some folks were talking about the end days, and somebody said, well, let them break out the guillotines. I am ready. I'll get my head chopped off. And I was thinking internally, I said, Lord, help us with that. Because we always brag about letting somebody chop our heads off. But we won't make minor adjustments to our own lives, giving up this or that for anybody else. I know if we can't give up certain things, that's just like uh, suppose somebody had a smoking habit. Listen to me, smokers. And you want to get rid of that habit and you have children. But you have that feeling in you. Yes, I would let somebody chop off my head. I'm not going to renounce my position in Christ. I let them go ahead and do it, just like the Bible says. So imagine this. You're willing to give up your life for the Lord, right? For his way. You're not going to renounce him in any way. So you would rather have somebody chop your head off. But here's a problem. In order to get your head chopped off in that moment, you've got to be willing to give up everything in your life to get your head chopped off. I have a problem with that. How can we be ready to go to the guillotine? And before you get to the guillotine, you're going to be imprisoned. And while you're imprisoned, you're not going to be fed right. And you're going to be stripped of everything in life. You're just not going straight to the guillotine. Your head gets chopped off and you don't feel the pain and it's over. That's not the way it's going to happen. No, you're going to be swooped up. You're going to be held for only God knows how long. And then at the end of all that suffering, then you'll be beheaded. But we say we'll go through that. But we won't give up anything we're doing now for the sake of children. How can we say that we're going to give up our heads for the sake of Christ? Go through only the Lord knows the process that's involved in that. We'll do that, but we won't give up the small things for the greatest cause that's right in front of our faces. See, something is wrong with that. I'll tell you what, myself, because I do it all the time, I will suffer a great amount of suffering for the sake of a person who does not even know I'm suffering for them. I say that boldly because I live that standard. And when it comes to people bragging, they won't give up anything, not a thing, so long as they're comfortable. They speak big, and they're always talking about what they're going to do in the future. I'm telling you right now, don't do that. Live it now. Because if you don't do it now, you're not going to do it then. And it's easy. It's a cop-out to say, yeah, go ahead and kill me. Get it over with. Right? That's easy. To get shot and die instantly is easy. That's an easy way out. Stay your mind from those patterns of thought that 
causes you to ignore all the sacrifices of this day. Because when you really ensure that somebody else is going to make it, you're going to make sacrifices right now, today, at this moment. You'll give up your lifestyle and your future for the sake of someone who won't even say thank you. Because you're not looking to make headlines. You're looking for people to make it. And you're doing something about it every day of your life. That's who we are. Again, looking at the small splinter in somebody else's eye and not realizing that we have a whole lot to learn is an error. The Lord says so. So again, he says, how can you say, brother, let me pull out the moat that is in thine eye when thou thyself beholdest not the beam that is in thine own eye? The Lord is saying, we don't even know. We're not even paying attention to the telephone pole in our eye. And we're trying to pull a splinter out of our brother's eye. In other words, if we apply this scripture to our lives, we're not going to be the ones that say, let me pull that out of your eye. Not ever. We're not going to do that. Because the truth is, until we leave this earth, we're going to have a telephone pole in our eye. But what we can do is encourage people to go in the right direction. What we can do is encourage a person to go find the physician. Don't be the go-to man or the go-to woman to fix somebody's problem. The world has people like that. They have psychics. They have this person, that person, gurus, and everything else. The Lord is telling us something here. Then he says, cast out first the beam out of thine eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to pull out the moat that is in thy brother's eye. You see that? Now, at first he said, how can you say, let me pull out the moat that is in thine eye? How can we go to somebody and say, well, let me let me show you how to have 20 times more faith when we know for a fact that there are points in our lives when we struggle with faith. First, perfect our own faith. And, and Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith, so that's his process. Once our faith is increased, once our faith is stable, once we're not doubting anymore, then we can go to that brother or sister in a very different capacity, not saying, let me pull this out. But what does the Lord says? He said, how can we do this and have a beam in our own eye? He says, first, cast out first the beam out of their own eye. And then you'll see clearly to pull out the moat that is in your brother's eye, not to go volunteer your services, to try and cause this person to be a follower. If you fix a person, you know that person's going to follow you. But there's another way. There's a way that you can pull the moat out of somebody's eye. They'll never perceive it was you. You know what it's called? Obedience unto the Lord. If I went to a person one-on-one, we could have this whole conversation, and they could see it. And then they would say, well, you know, it was that guy who talked to me. That's why I'm so thankful for that guy. But we can have this conversation collectively. The word can be released. The word is alive. It's not dead. The word can be released in a setting just like this. You're being pointed to a solution here, to something that the Lord's going to work with you on. In other words, I open the door for you. I know where you can get fixed. Now, isn't that just like pulling something out of your eye? If I take you to a place where it can be pulled out, you better believe it. But the number one key is another principle shared. If I do it myself, you're going to look at me. But if I show you the physician, you'll always know where to go. How would you help a person? By doing it yourself or pointing someone in the direction of the one who can always pull it out when they have it? When you want to point to the physician, only pride will cause any man or woman to do something and want the praise for it. But you don't think it's there? I've seen it. I've seen pastors get jealous of things. Where does that jealousy come from? Because they wanted the recognition themselves. And how did that happen to them? You ever get like that? I've seen it out of a lot of people. Because everybody wants to be the one. That's that point of contact with the Lord. What they truly want is to be recognized. Listen to me carefully. You're already recognized. You already matter. No one need do any of those things to matter or to be recognized or to be loved or to be accepted. You're accepted, recognized, and you're loved. But people do that out of brokenness because they've been pushed away too much. They've been told to be quiet too much. They know that people don't want their opinion. And you can always tell a person when, when they have lived a life where no one wants to hear what they have to say, they're constantly trying to tell people what they think. You can always tell that. If you notice it, you're not to really say anything about it. Just take note. Understand the person. Because when we speak, we speak in a specific way. And that specific way is telling us who that person is. How you speak communicates who you are. How you speak. If you don't care, you'll never reach the ability to truly discern. But when you care about the other person, and you're not thinking about yourself. Your discernment is at a very high level. It's at a very low level. When you care about yourself over the other people, then you can't see anything. The giftings of the Lord always work when you have forsaken yourself for their sakes. In other words, they work when your heart is full of love itself. 
Love is almost like a battery to the giftings of the Lord. They're powered by love itself, not worldly love, but the love of God. And if you love your Father in heaven, you also love what He loves, your fellow man. And you'll never call what the Lord loves your enemy, will you? So then love your enemies. That's a statement to identify to those of you who have not fully changed yet. To love those who have done things against you. To realize who they are. Because to love your enemy is to realize who that enemy actually is. It is to see who that person truly is. The only way to love your enemies is to understand who they are. Their past representation of you when you were still in sin. That's who they are. That's why I don't like pointing at anybody. Doesn't matter what a person does. All of us have done things. And everything I would say of anybody is somewhere in my past. So how could I ever point to anybody out for being any worse than I was? I, I can't do that. Aren't you thankful the Lord didn't have you pointed out in view of all the world for those things you did? I'm certainly not going to do it to somebody else, unless I have to go through that myself. Because the Lord did say, if you criticize without understanding, in other words, when you truly don't know what you're talking about or you don't understand why a person is corrupted in certain areas, He's going to fix that because he wants you to operate in truth. And the way he fixes that is he puts you in the position of the person you're criticizing. In other words, your situation becomes their situation. You don't ever want to go through that so that you will understand that person perfectly. And once you do that, you will never point again. People point because they don't comprehend. Okay, let's continue. A good man out of a good treasure of his heart bringing forth that which is good. So if your heart is full of complaints, how can good come out of your mouth? The Lord said something about that, didn't he? He just told us that every tree is known by its own fruit. For of thorns, men do not gather figs. You're not going to go looking. Here, here it is. This is almost like a matching type of mindset you should have here. When we have a lot of complaints coming out of our mouth, you first must understand this principle. The Lord said, out of the mouth flows the abundance of the heart. So that means whatever is coming out of your mouth, you have an abundance of in your heart. Now, he didn't say it anywhere else. He said, in your heart. And do you know what your heart is? Now, we're talking about the spiritual heart here. Do you know what your heart is? Your heart is the place where you pour out things upon another human being. You listening to me? That comes from your heart. The heart is the place where praise is found for the living God. The heart is the place where men have conjured and accepted evil things and done the unthinkable. The heart is the place when it begins to overflow and you begin to speak. That is the fruit of your life. All of the fruit of your whole life is in your heart. And out of your heart, your words come. So that means if a person is grumpy and complaining all the time, that person needs the physician right away. They're having an emergency because their life is reflecting nothing good inside them. Listen to what I'm saying. When you hear people out there and you hear foul stuff coming out of their hearts, it'll always be full of complaints. That person is probably not as bad as you think, but that person is overwhelmed by darkness. They don't understand their life. They don't understand what the Lord is doing. And if the Lord allows us to recognize a person like that, it is not to condemn them. It is to assist in the work the Lord is doing in their lives. We're not to point fingers at a person like that saying, well, they're condemned. Listen to how they talk. That's not what it's for. If the Lord said, judge not that ye be not judged, then why would he allow you to notice somebody else who is somewhat corrupted in the world? Why? Not to judge them. If he told us not to judge, then we, and if we can't do anything about judging them in the first place, he didn't allow us to notice that so that we could judge them. No, so that we could participate in what the Lord is already doing. You know that day that comes in the day of the Lord when he says anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord is going to be saved in that day? Those are the ones we missed. See, they're out there right now. But if we keep thinking that when we see corruption, like we never had any, when we see corruption, we're to stay away from that person. That person sins. Run. When we start doing that stuff, if we keep thinking this way, we're not going to assist in the gospel of Jesus Christ. What we're going to do is is sever ourselves off from everybody who is just like us and that's not doing the work of the lord and so what the lord will do at the very end is anybody who calls out on his name in truth they're going to be saved at that time because we missed them i believe those are the ones we missed those are the ones we couldn't get to but they're out there right now there are people that are about to die and all of you know them but who has gone to these individuals to say hey look well, now I know your position and everything else, but uh, I 
Have you considered some things with the Lord? Who's gone to them in some talk of sobriety? A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. He's telling you that the fruit of a man goes right into his heart and out of his heart he speaks. That is the process. We never covered this before because people were just not there yet. Your fruit that you gather, the fruit of your life. Jesus said, you'll know a tree by its fruit. You'll know it no other way. The fruit of a man accumulates in the heart and then out of the abundance of the heart, a man speaketh. So let me ask you this. What is the majority of your conversation? Is it about what's going wrong or is it about what you're thankful for? Don't answer out loud. That's something for you to think about because that will give you the reflection you're looking for. You'll know who you are. You'll know what changes you have to make. Consequently, you can also know anybody by how they speak. There are people out there that are full of nothing but complaints. Now, don't make a mistake between a person who's full of complaints and a person who teaches because you have a lot of people who teach about the wrongdoings of society. They're pointing them out. Ministers do that sometimes. I'll tell you, well, this person is exercising ungodly principles by doing this and by doing that. They're not complaining. They're pointing things out. All right, don't make that mistake thinking, well, they're full of complaints. No, that's not what it is. If they point something out, if they're utilizing that for teaching, that's not a complaint. No more than the Lord commanded the prophets about the wicked people in so many different places of what he was going to do to them. That That's teaching. And then the prophets went and gave that message to the people, saying, hey, look, that's a wicked people. So they weren't complaining either, but they were teaching. So understand the difference between the two. But the majority of your conversation, the majority of another's conversation, that's how you find out who they are. Now you know how to utilize a portion of your discernment. By this instruction, you can know who is who. But listen, here's another key. You don't have to be patient enough to hear them, not cut them off, hear them, not assume anymore. Hear that you don't have to assume. You can know people by this principle all the time, and it's always 100% accurate, 100% accurate. That's only the beginning because there is a purely spiritual side that goes to this. If you can be obedient, being patient, to be wise, right? Be wise also. In in Proverbs, it says a wise man is slow to speak and quick to listen. So if you can be one of those, right, you will hear many things, but you'll only accept the words of the Messiah. That's what I do. I can read many things. I can hear many things, but I know the Lord's voice. The Lord's voice is what is written in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's what I hear. When I hear something in alignment with the gospel, if I hear it from a rock, a bird, a piece of grass, wherever I hear it from, I know it's the voice of the Lord. In that way, we fulfill the scripture. My sheep hear my voice, and a stranger they will not follow. Why? Because we have a recognition of what are the words of the Messiah and what are not the words of the Messiah. Those who truly believe in Christ, they have discernment. But be warned, you do know that they're changing who Jesus is. And let me suggest to you how. And it goes back to the beginning of this conversation when we were talking about those who are in the book of Revelation, who blasphemed God, who blasphemed his tabernacle, who blamed everything upon him, who hated, who gave gifts to one another when the two witnesses died. These individuals who truly do hate God, they're just like Satan. They know exactly who God is. They were once with him, but now they're in a fallen state. The same thing Satan did, so will his followers do and have done. That's why they blaspheme him and blame him for what's happening on the earth in the book of Revelation. They're blaming him because they absolutely believe in him and they absolutely do not like him. They don't agree with him. They agree with Lucifer. Having said that, you can see the world clearly if you open your eyes to this truth, to the truth of the words of Christ. The world becomes clear without ambiguity. It's no longer an enigma, but very plain. Once you see it that way, you can navigate the world very effectively. You won't be frightened all the time either because everything has its place and there's a massive work for us to do. 